Here we go. See? Atoma, man. I'm telling you, it's terrible. Okay. Got it. All right, so, we're on. I have with me today Christopher Benson, who was born in Providence, Rhode Island in 1960 and grew up in a family of well-known artists, artisans, and arts educators in nearby Newport. From 1975 to 79, he attended the Woodstock Country School in South Woodstock, Vermont. Uh, the Woodstock Country School, also known as WCFs, was a small, alternative, arts-friendly boarding school founded in the 1940s by a former student and teacher from the fa famous Black Mountain School. His background gave it a strong affinity for the arts and humanities. At WCS, Benson took a rigorous three-year studio course in oil painting and art history with Peter Devine, a realist painter who had recently transitioned from abstraction, but yet retained a strong modernist sensibility. Devine has remained an important mentor, friend, and colleague ever since. Benson also studied English literature and writing with the authors Mark Edmondson and briefly with Michael Pollan, who also taught for a short time at the school. After graduating from WCS, Benson applied to and was accepted at RISD, where he continued to focus on painting. In 1988, Benson raised funds from a group of collectors to paint for a year in the American Southwest. He ended up spending three years in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he continued to work part-time as a carpenter and also as a studio assistant to Eleanor Morris Caponegro, a fine arts book designer who'd worked with noted artists such as Georgia O'Keeffe, Elliot Porter, Eric Fischel, and many others. Benson also had his first exhibition at the Llewellyn Contemporary Gallery in Santa Fe in 1992. Benson has exhibited in galleries and museums in the Southwest, Midwest, and on both coasts for over 30 years. He is a two-time recipient of the Pollock Krasner Painting Fellowship Grant, and his work resides in private museum collections throughout the United States, Canada, and the UK. Christopher, thank you for joining me today. So glad to be here. Oh, I wanted to say one more thing. I didn't mean to leave this this bit out. This is uh, <laughs> pretty important. Benson is also an author, designer, and publisher of books about other artists at his company, The Fisher Press in Santa Fe. Christopher, thank you for joining me today. Uh, you recently You recently put out a book, right? Yeah. What's that, <laughs> Which what was that book called? <laughs> uh, we just, I, this was a wild uh, thing. I, I had an idea with my brother. Um, our grandfather, who was a, a stone carver in Rhode Island, they, there's an old uh, stone carving shop where they, it goes back to colonial times where they made slate gravestones, hand carved, you know. And my grandfather took it over from the family that had founded it in the 1700s, in the early part of the 20th century. Wow. He was part of a group of artisans there at the shop and also in New England who were kind of carrying on the arts and crafts movement ethos. And they did lectures and talks and published little pamphlets and books about art, art practice. And my brother and I thought it would be fun to do a kind of updated, co-published John Stevens Shop and Fisher Press book about what artists do about artists practice. And so we came up with the idea for art in the making. And this was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So we we were going to just make a little thing. And then it just grew and grew and grew. I kept inviting more people to be in it. You are in it. Lots of wonderful painters, sculptors, musicians, poets. I mean, it's just all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And it's turned into a 450-page illustrated collection of essays and it's really neat i mean people love it we've we've moved a lot of them a lot of people you know, i think we've gotten rid of about 1100 books at this point wow and so they're getting out there you know they're not on amazon or anything but they're they're getting out in the world which is good so that is excellent wow but wow. i do books for other artists i do a lot of pre-press work with digital imagery and i'm basically a di i mean if there's a big epson printer right next to me and i started out doing limited edition books printed on an Epson inkjet printer. And wow. then I moved to having other companies print books that I designed. Wow. Uh, this is the book, by the way. I happen to have there it. There it is. Nice that plug. Is Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun book. Everybody it really is. Actually, like it's, it's quite good. That's yeah. quite good. 
Um, and I think it's pretty unique too. I mean, what I really wanted to do was to have artists talk directly to the reader about what they do rather than to have their ideas filtered through some third party, you know, an academic or a critical interpreter. Mm. I, I feel like we know more about what we're doing than those people. So I wanted to have a chance for us to talk about it. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, I certainly, um, it was, I mean, it still is an incredible privilege for me to be a part of that project. Uh, so, so thank you so much for that. Well, you are most welcome. It's really nice to have you in there. It was a real fine caliber of artisans and artists that you have, um, collected to get into this, into this book. Yeah. So, well, it's, I really made a calculated decision to mix fairly well-known people, not like superstars in the fancy, you know, there's, there's none of the sort of Andy Warhol level mm -hmm. of, of artist celebrity in there, but there are some very important, well-known artists. And then there are people nobody knows anything about. So I wanted to put us all on a level field and say, look, there's all these people out there who do wonderful work, who you probably never heard of. And here's a chance for them to show you what they do and talk about what they do and, and put them in the company of people who are not better artists than they are, but who have had a little more success in getting their names out there. So mm -hmm. that to me was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was good of you to give me uh, someone who is, is not well known and, and, you know, Come on, you're a superstar. <laughs> no, dude, I'm not. I'm I'm super far away from that. Um, no, I, but I but that was that was really nice. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I understand that you have uh, a show coming up soon. Is that is that correct? Well, the interesting thing with the book is we're going to do a big show of the artists in the book at my gallery, the gallery where I show here in Santa Fe. It's called the Vogue Contemporary, and they're going to put on a two month show of as many of the artists from the book as we can cram in that space. And it's a nice big space. And then I have a show of my own um, more abstract paintings that's going on at the Washburn Gallery in New York City on uh, in Chelsea. Okay. And as I was saying to you before we lit up here, that's a gallery I have an old family connection with. It's an old friend of mine who runs it and his mom who founded it was uh, showed my uncle's work many, many years ago. So I have a long-standing connection with them and this is the first time we've done something together and i'm really excited about it because they're lovely people and it's a beautiful they show great stuff you know so yeah, yeah. abstract they're mostly an ab i mean i know they did different stuff and have handled different kinds of work over the years but through joan washburn's tenure there since she and she's still there it's still her gallery it was really um Mostly at first and second generation abstract expressionist work or, you know, abstract work, American. Wow. So, wow. Anyway. Well, Christopher, Great I mean, place how, to be. How, well, an in, in excellent place to be in. And, and first of all, congratulations for, for Thanks. this incredible show that's coming up. Well, both shows. Um, this, but this is interesting though, because you're, like, would you consider yourself primarily a figurative based painter, like you're representational, or would you consider yourself more of an abstract painter first? Well, this is the tricky thing, because as I was saying to you earlier, everything, all painting became abstract to me in some sense. And I also, my early training was with a guy who was a realist who had a very abstract sensibility. He had been an abstract painter. And so he was very interested in making representational work, but it was filtered through or interpreted through for the surface and for the the structure and, and composition as an abstract thing. Mm -hmm. And and a kind of uh, what do you what do you call it when you when you just extemporaneously create something that's uh Oh God, I can't remember words. You know, they like go right out of my head. Me too. I mean, that's that's <laughs> like a part of my daily living. I have four children. I don't. And know. you're young. Well, relatively <laughs> speaking, but thank I you. I have an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, improvisational is what uh, I was. Thinking. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Sort of like jazz, you know, sort of like yeah. jazz improvisation. Yeah. So I've painted realism, you know, all my life. I've been a figurative painter all my life. And I do architectural scenes and interiors and figures and seascapes. And But they have always had a really strong formal component. 
Okay. And they're very much about the surface of the paint. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, well, when when you say when you say the surface of the paint, you're you're talking about like the language of surface, right? You're talking about I'm talking about the physical surface. I'm talking about the sort of the sculpture and the and the depth of oil painting sitting on the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, to me, it's a physical thing. I'm looking at a little oil painting by a friend here, and it is it may be flat, but it's got all this depth that's mm. created by the layers of the paint and the their relationship to one another, the colors relationship to one another. It's a physical thing. So mm -hmm. that's what I love. I mean, more so than narrative. Mm -hmm. My paintings are not particularly narrative. They may have recognizable components, but they're never really telling a story, except that I kind of put things there in the hopes that you'll tell your own story. Yeah. Yeah. Or make yeah. up your own story. You know what I mean? So, so your, your, so your connection is what is really seen in the painting. It's, it's like your, your sort of like an inherent kind of like, uh, I wouldn't want to say improvisational connection because it's certainly it's not improvised, but it's something that is established, but maybe expressed in a way that does feel more improvised. You know, I mean, like certainly cultivated and you know and sustained over over a long period of time through many iterations through many different paintings right um mm -hmm. uh but but also with with the room and the freedom of expression to be uh improvisational you know and and the kind of paint in a way that's more like um typically well, I, was, I was thinking of the word automatism before you know this <laughs> idea that that thing is just kind of like emerge things sort of come out you know and just yes. sort of make, yes make yeah yeah well what and that's how i like to work i mean i i certainly go to the canvas or the surface with an idea you know mm -hmm. there's a thing i want to make a picture of and even in the last 20 years when i've been making full-on abstract paintings which i do concurrently with my representation so i do both um and often i do something in between and they I may kind of start with a with a feeling about what I want to see on the canvas. And so I'll start to put things down. But then each subsequent move is somewhat dictated by what I had just done. OK. So the, the painting unfolds in under my hand and in front of me yeah. in a way that I didn't expect. To me, that's what it has to be in order to be interesting, Yeah. in order to yeah. be engaging. Otherwise, yeah. it feels too formulaic to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i don't so, like this start i mean the, i had a big problem when i was in college because it was in the 80s the early 80s when conceptual art was really on the rise and i was not a conceptual artist and i wasn't interested in making conceptual art i didn't because that's antithetical to what i love about painting mm -hmm. painting is not to me conceptual you don't start with a fully formed idea that then the art is going to describe to the viewer at least i don't some people right. do some I people don't. have that process yeah. yeah yeah the painting that i love the most going all the way back to forever is is a thing that happens on the canvas and you don't know when you start where it's going to take you yeah you know and i think that was true for rembrandt i think it was true for even for people who did very um very clearly descriptive, even narrative pictures, the strongest ones to me are the ones that have an element of surprise, an element of discovery. The artist was discovering something while they made it. Well, do you think Caravaggio did that? Less so. Caravaggio, to me, is a more conceptual artist. Yeah, <laughs> if I, can I, say he, that, he, I, I think he is. Because he's, he's, he's really telling a story, you, you know, and there you get into that interesting thing between I've had a lot of debates with people about illustration versus painting. Right. And what's the difference between these two things? Yeah. And ultimately, I've decided art happens in everything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you're doing. I mean, even in, in even in works that are so different from what I do, the art is the thing that any of us who make things find when they're working. And that can be in very highly conceptual work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's just a different way of coming at it, I guess. And I'm yeah. so much a painter. I'm just a painter, you know, more than anything else. So. Yeah. Um, 
so how so vitality is very important to your work um do you ever experience like in your process of of sort of building a painting or constructing the painting that uh as you're moving from like one move to another move to another move that you step back and it's all just sort of like dying oh god yeah oh, volume, god. so to speak what Dead do you do the door now. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do you know what i do a lot some of my best paintings going all the way back to when i was a kid there was i i, I had I had a painting I did when I was 17 years old and I went out into a graveyard, an old colonial cemetery behind my house, which was filled with the gravestones that my, my father's shop had carved back in the 1700s. I mean, the, the, the people who founded that shop. Wow. And so it was, you know, a place I knew it was a beautiful place, but also sort of spooky. And I went out and I'd made a very realistic on-site painting from life rendered picture of it and it was just dead it had no life and i i and the more i fussed with it the worse it got the deader it became and what i ended up doing was i left it in a corner for a while and then i picked it up and i painted brown like umber paint over the whole thing and then scraped it off and there was this wonderful ghosted magical image there huh. and i went back in with new paint and kind of like boom, 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 boom. And I did all these things to liven it up. And all of a sudden it had all this life. So I've done that again and again. When I when I make a painting that's that's just dead, I'll often paint over it, but leave enough of it showing that I can pull something out. And those mm. are some of my favorite paintings. Mm. So, I like that. I like to destroy things. And I've painted over many paintings and scraped them off and made new paintings on top of them. I do that all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm very rarely satisfied. Yeah, yeah, I I, <laughs> I, sh I share that as well. Um, I don't think I'm ever satisfied, <laughs> which is kind of like- Listen, I think that I think that anybody who loves everything they do, it's the kiss of death. Because mm -hmm. you're not gonna make anything good if you love everything you do. Yeah. It's just not, I'm sorry. Maybe you yeah. think you are, but that's the problem. <laughs> you know yeah yeah definitely yeah i mean and that's something too where it's like i'm i'm never satisfied but but there are moments where there's like a partial satisfaction maybe like a like a, a, a small measure of it um but i have to be like but my painting painting isn't about me being satisfied no right it's it's actually <clears throat> it's about something like way beyond that um I mean, oh, well, like what? How do you? That's a good thing, but I want to know more. <laughs> what do you mean by way beyond? What's way uh, beyond? Like, like I'm, I'm trying to touch something, you know, that is untouchable. Yeah. Um, and way well beyond my reach. Uh, and so, to be satisfied is to be delusional for me. <laughs> like, you know you what I mean? You said like, it, brother. That's it. I'm with you. I, I feel mean, the same way. Yeah. So but there are moments there are moments like like the partial satisfaction comes into play when i i sense that the reach either one of two things and, and it's wonderful it's wonderful when both things happen but either i feel as though my reach has expanded or the thing that i'm reaching towards draws closer to me and it's even greater when both happen simultaneously that feels mad. That's like magic. It's like pure magic. Yep. I understand you know? that. I have that same experience. I mean, my version of that. It's, um, and you know, I was watching a couple of years ago, I went back and rewatched those interviews between Joseph Campbell and um, Bill Moyers. Bill Moyers interv interviewing Joseph Campbell. Have you ever seen those? No. Uh -huh. Oh, they're wonderful. Yeah. Um, and, uh, somewhere in there campbell is talking about art and, and this is a guy who at that point this is in the in the 1980s he had been alive and conscious all through the 20th century so he was in his 80s in the early 1980s which means that the art that he knew the painting that he knew when he talked about painting was modernism it was paul clay it was oh, yeah. even earlier modernism not necessarily the height of the like the new york school type of stuff yeah and, and he said, what the artist does is 
like what the shaman in old hunter gatherer cultures did. They go out in search of something and something comes to them from beyond, you know, it isn't necessarily God. It's, it's a thing that is bigger than themselves for which they become a conduit. And it's achieving the clarity to become the conduit for the thing that's larger than yourself. And I really believe that. I think that art, when it really works, it isn't me doing it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean there's a guy with a beard in the sky who's doing it either. It's something, it's the whole big creation of the universe somehow speaking through you somehow. And that's where the truth in it comes from. Because it's not something you're manufacturing in your head. You're receiving it and then transmitting it like an amplifier. Does that make mm -hmm. any sense? Sure. Yeah, sure, it's, sure. That's kind of, you know, that's kind of hokey, I suppose, but it's how I feel. Well, it, 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 this is the thing, you know, we're trying to talk about something that language just fails to aspire to in, in describing the very thing that we're trying <laughs> to talk about. And so like the only way, I mean, like to, it's like the only way to really do it is to either be an incredible poet, right? Which, which. Well, I think painters I, are poets. Well, I well, yeah, I mean, like, like, in a, yeah, like, in a, like, you know, within like the visual language, right? I mean, but like, <clears throat> here, here's the thing: it's like to talk about what we're talking about. It, it's it's very difficult to to not. It's very difficult to stay out of the the zone of like, well, like. um a type of like romance or, or, um, yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, and something that's something, yes. It's very easy to fall into, um, sentimentality. It's very easy to fall into a romantic, um, projection. Yeah. That we carry around in our heads. And that's something that I fight against a lot of the time. You know, it's, I have to pull back from it, mm -hmm. you know, part of me and the other thing too that i mean this is a whole other topic but it's an important one to me is unless you got a lot of money that came from your family we all have to make a living yeah. you know in order to keep painting i gotta sell paintings to pay the bills yeah and so i fought i a lot of painters a lot of artists struggle with this it's our struggle you know to find the way that we can be true to what it is that we're aspiring to yeah and at the same time, make a thing that that's marketable, that somebody will buy, you know? And these are two completely different things and they are not compatible a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And if you look at any really great painter from the past, they were all struggling with this, yeah. you know? And they were all fighting with their patrons. And they were, you know, they had the patron wanted them to do this, the Pope or the King or the whoever it was wanted Goya or Velasquez or Rembrandt to do something that they didn't really want to do. Yeah. And so they would find ways to kind of sneak the thing that they wanted to do into the thing that the other guy wanted. Right. right. <laughs> That's right. So for me, yeah. it's like, for me, I actually have very segregated kinds of painting that I do for different purposes, mm -hmm. you know, and there's, there's very marketable stuff that I make. And then there's stuff that is much more satisfying to me and, I've been successful with both of them. I mean, people buy both of them from me, but uh, I'm less and less interested in, it, it gets too formulaic when you're making a thing for the market. And yeah. everybody struggles with this. You know, yeah. people yeah. who who project an image of total purity and, oh, we're just about the art and we don't do that. We're, we're, we're not selling out. Everybody sells out. You have to sell out to survive, you know? So where do you find the balance? The market, in a sense, dictates that, um, I mean, to be very successful, I mean, gosh, you know, it will, <clears throat> so this is kind of a-, a, a I'm a, sorry, I got us off on a very difficult tangent there, because it's well, something it's, people it's, don't like to talk about. It's difficult, but I mean, you know, I'll tell you, it's like, it's something that everyone struggles with, you know, and, and the first thing I was going to say before, um, was that what you were describing when you were talking about the shaman and the relationship with the artist being like a conduit and stuff like that. You know, the interesting thing is that there are, are, are 
varying views on the role of the artist, the role, you know, um, <clears throat> and how, and how that, that is to serve like, you know, humanity and mankind and things like that and society and culture and, and whatnot. Um, but it's, it is something that is experienced fundamentally, you know, in, uh, fundamentally on a universal scale, like every, you want it to be, you, you everybody it experiences yeah. like, these these moments of like of uh, like transcending like there's like a transcendent kind of uh, experience you know exactly yeah and well you know the our book well, I found one of the things that I found so interesting about the essays book is that we've got 91 different creative people in there I can't tell you how many of them are saying the same thing yeah right so many of them are saying the same thing that that I don't know what I'm doing I go make this stuff. Sometimes I hit it. Sometimes it speaks. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. And I really like that that comes through again and again and again, because I think that is what art is. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stuff that's called art now, which I don't relate to. And I don't see so much art in it. Mm -hmm. Art to me is a word that describes a kind of alchemical interactive process with making in which something bigger than yourself happens. If you're just making propaganda or political commentary or deconstructive cultural critique, you're not leaving room for that thing to happen. And so you can call it art all day long, but to me, the thing that I love about art is missing from a lot of that work. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yes. And it's not that great art can't have all that stuff in it. It does. It often does. It's just that, it needs the other thing too. Otherwise it leaves me flat, mm. you know? Well, there's certainly a difference between, you know, it, it's it's making me think of a conversation I had with my daughter a couple of days ago. She's she's really into the arts as well. My oldest daughter. Uh-huh. How old is she? She's 15. Dangerous age. That's when you can really get hooked on this stuff. <laughs> the gateway drug. <laughs> she's she's all in man she's like all yeah, that's um, great and her you know her brain is wired in such a way that it makes a lot of sense for her to to engage in it it just makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. um but you know it's what's so interesting is that she was talking to me about aiming at a target she was like and she brought that up she's like i'm it's like she's like it's like i'm aiming at something and i said well i was like are your eyes open or are they closed no, and she's like, oh no, they're closed. She's like, because, <laughs> but, but I, you know, I was, we kind of talked about it and, and we sort of like, but it really came into the effect of like, well, there are times when, you know, well, there are different types of targets. And one is when the artist themselves makes a target and they set it up and they stand back at a distance that, that they, uh, that they prescribe like they're, i'm going to step back this amount of distance when i aim and i'm going to fire that is a type of, of interaction with a target that one type of artist can do but there's another type of target and it's a target that exists somewhere out in a space that is relatively unknown and you're trying to find it well and here's the thing like <laughs> like it's it's like it's like shooting at a target in the dark where you know it's there somewhere. And it doesn't matter if your eyes are open or closed, you can't see it. And and really the only the only way to hit the target is to listen through something else. It's like to be to be truly hokey, it's like Luke Skywalker doing the 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 you know the lightsaber with the helmet with the visor closed. You know what I mean? <laughs> well he's He's utilizing the force there, isn't he? And, you know, uh, going back to Joseph Campbell, Lucas, and, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the Star Wars movies, but Lucas, when he was making those, was talking to Joseph Campbell a lot about the shamanistic journey and, the, and this thing of looking for something bigger than ourselves. And that's what the force is, you know? Yeah. And... That's the Tao, man. That's the that's the big woo. And that's what we're after. That's what I'm after, you know? And it can be ugly and dirty and screwed up. And it's not this ethereal kind of, you know, pure, cleanly, 
virtuous thing. It's the messy business of life. It's in everything, you know, it's, and it's what holds everything. It's what we're all made out of. So to me, art touches on that and it, and it ties us together. We go to it and we find each other. It's a, it's a conversation. It's a conversation with the person looking at it. And you're just making something that, that facilitates that conversation and that discovery between you and that next person. Okay. And it's different for everybody. So tell me, tell me, Christopher, what, what type of conversation are you making <laughs> uh, for, uh, for someone who engages with your work? Well, to go back to what I was saying about the market, you know, um, I've always been made, able to make things that people like to buy and hang on the wall. You know, I can make a beautiful seascape. People love them. They sell like hotcakes. I can't keep making them over and over again because they become stale and formulaic and commercial. And so I make some for a little while until the juice goes out and then I stop. But all the time in the background, you know, I've had things like that that I've done all my throughout my career to sell. I was a portrait painter. I, I, I was a for hire portrait painter for a while. I never really loved doing it, but it was in, the, I learned a lot. Always on, on, on another plane in another part of my life, I've been making this much more searching work that's about all this stuff we're talking about. It falls flat a lot of the time, but what I'm really, but you know, gradually over the years, it's gotten better. And I think I've gotten better at it. Yeah. And the work I'm doing now, which is kind of some, it hovers somewhere between abstraction and representation. And you have one of those paintings. I do. And that to me is my best work. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, because it isn't something that I've, that I've uh, self-consciously manufactured. It's a thing where I went in and I started making moves and things happened that were out of my control. That, that is exactly what that painting has in it. And it, it is, it's quite large for the degree of freshness that it contains. I mean, how, how do you work on a scale like that? And well, it's not a little painting, is it? It's got, it's reasonably big. It's not big. a little painting. It's actually, a, it's a very good sized painting. And it's like, you know, but, but. Well, you know. The movements are big on it, Christopher. But Brian, like, that's one of those ones that I'm talking about where I started out and I did a very fussily rendered realist picture out my window of my studio and I didn't like it. And I painted it brown and I scraped it off and I went back in and I extracted the life force that I'd been looking for, but hadn't found the first time. And it why, came- why, why didn't you find it the first time? Like because what, was, what was keeping you from accessing that? Because I was trying too hard to control it. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the best answer I can give you. I was trying to control it. I was trying to manufacture it. And my, for me, the best art doesn't happen when I'm manufacturing it. Yeah. Yeah. It becomes too stylized. It becomes too stilted, um, kind of dorky looking. You know, my a lot of my realism I'm embarrassed by because I think it's kind of looks like, to me, it looks like sort of 1950s Walt Disney illustration. It's stylized. It's sort of, sort of hokey looking. A hokey is a word I keep using. I don't know why it's coming out today, but that's kind of how I feel about a lot of that work. You know. Yeah. 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 And when I break through and get past that and let this, I'm a very intense, passionate, angry dude, you know? And if I'm repressing that and not letting that come through, then I'm not being true to the thing that drives me. Yeah. And that painting of yours and the ones like it that I like, they got a lot of, they got a lot of punch. They do. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. Like that, that's the thing that, that was amazing. Because I'm a puncher. You're a puncher. <laughs> I mean, in lots of ways. There, you know, I'll tell you what, man. That that was that was one thing that really struck me. I mean, I I saw it in the image when I saw the reproduction, but when I got it and I was beholding it like as an object, I was. I mean, it was amazing to me how much energy was building up in that painting, and it was like even at that size, it felt like the painting could even be bigger with that with the amount of of force mm -hmm. that you had in that thing it was just it builds up so much and and it's <laughs> like, like like i was telling you like i was having that conversation with my son about it because he 
he loves that painting. Like he, he wished that I painted that painting. He was yeah. like, he was like, I wish you, cause he loves it so much. And, and, um, but we had a great conversation about that, you know, that's cool. Yeah. It's super cool, man. And he, he, he can't see your work objectively cause he's surrounded by it all the time. Mine just is coming in from outside. So he's seeing it in a different way, you know, cause I love, that's what I love about your painting. Your painting's full of that stuff. Wow, man. I appreciate you know? that. And I, I'm, I mean it. It's, it's. I, I love how raw and expressive and kind of weird and spooky it is. That's, that's what I'm drawn to. You know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose I'm a weird and spooky guy. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> those are the people I like. My poor children. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, Elizabeth and I joke about you know making sure we have enough money put aside for a therapy fund. Yeah. <laughs> but being that we have four children, it's gonna have to be like a four in one kind of session. <laughs> My kids, you know, I grew up in a in a family of artists and it was it was complicated. Wonderful people, and I love them, but but also very difficult and complicated people with a lot of buried and and frustrated and and angry and resentful stuff under the surface you know on, and right up on the surface sometimes and we all have it and it's we're all kind of you know wrestling with each other all the time and but it makes life interesting because that's what the world's like mm -hmm. i really like that that uh that image of wrestling you know yeah. because you know sometimes wrestling can be like like incredibly violent in the struggle, but then there are other times when it's almost like a dance and there's like this, this beautiful technical um, sort of choreographed movement in it. And and it can be like, if one, if one like wrestles enough, they can get really good at it, you know, to where it's, it almost, it almost feels like they're floating, you know, in a way. And it just, floating kind of moving about gravity doesn't exist you know and there's just like these weird things that happen and 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 i you know i'll tell you what man like like i feel like there are times in painting when that happens but it it almost it always seems to happen and like these moments can't be forced like the, you can't force that to happen you know it just sort of happens where like like a movement it's like you move in a certain way that that actually feels incredibly natural like it, mm -hmm. it feels like the most natural movement you've ever experienced in your life, you know, yeah. but it's, it's one that is so difficult to access. Well, yeah. And it is the most natural. It's very hard. You know, we, as we age, grow up and age, we layer stuff, you know, lots of kind of received wisdom and, and uh, impressions and prejudices and ideas that just get the, piled up like this and somewhere underneath all of that is who we really are yeah and when that can come through all of that and yet be filtered through all that interesting stuff that's when you get this thing you know and it's hard to get to if it was easy it wouldn't be any good yeah well see that's the thing it, it gets back to that struggle it gets back to you and me and every painter who's painting in a way that we we desire to paint in a way that we're like striving to paint and what comes out is this like like way all too controlled like too self-conscious kind of like thing that comes out and you're like oh my gosh you know this is this is what's there and so we we destroy it and we, we wrestle with it and it's like in that it's almost like when we've exhausted all our resources and we're kind of like doing these hail marys these like sort of hail mary moments absolutely so Something happens that is like. Well, I think you have to. I think it's only when you've um, when you've exhausted yourself with trying to manipulate a thing mm -hmm. that you finally just surrender. And at that moment, all the doorways open. And if you're there, if you're present, and you got the brush in your hand, or whatever, or the pen, or whatever, the typewriter, it comes through. You know, the guitar, the whatever your voice it's 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 when you've you've tried and tried and tried and tried and then suddenly you stop trying and it's there it is you know so man 
I don't know. It's a weird thing to do, but I like it. I mean, I don't, somebody says, I don't know who it is. You know, there are all these quotes out there that get attributed to 10 or 11 different people, but somebody, I think it could have been Cole Porter. It might've been someone else was asked, don't you love to write? And the person, whoever it was said, I sometimes like having written, you know, wow. <laughs> isn't that good? Such Doesn't that say it all? It says it all. <laughs> yes, it does. Because it's, it's sweating bullets. It's a struggle. You know, Hopper talked about how hard it was for him to write, actually. Oh, and and but and painting is like that too. It's like I have a really I cannot get myself to start some days. It's like pulling teeth. I dread it. And then I get in there and I make that first thing. And then it's like, okay, now we can work. And then I screw it all up and I gotta go back and yeah. But I've got this canvas on the easel. It's been there for a month and I haven't, it's just glaring at me every time I walk in here. Mm -hmm. I've got a few of those too, man. You know, what's a great thing to watch. Um, I, I watch a lot of, of um, I'm really interested in what other, you know, one of the reasons why I did this book was I'm really interested in what other painters go through. I love talking to you. I love talking to Gage Optenbrow. I love talking to my friends who paint, my friend Leslie Park, my friend Sue McNally, who I had this great show with. We all are going through the same thing and we all have our own voices. And um, now I've lost the thread. I started, oh, oh, so I watch a lot of films, you know, documentary films about other painters. There's a great one about Clifford Still. Yeah. Not my favorite painter, but mm -hmm. I really learned a lot about him and a lot about being a painter watching that. And there's a really great one that's a conversation with Philip Guston. And Guston was this guy who had extraordinary skill. He was a really refined, really skillful painter. He knew how to move the stuff around. And he made these beautiful kind of ethereal aesthetic abstractions at the heyday of, you know, abstract painting in New York back in the 40s. And then when I was in college, he went off on this tangent and did all those weird things with the Ku Klux Klan guys and the cigars and the boots and the, you know, all the weird Philip Gustin stuff that he's now so famous for. And which people hated at the time, by the way. They I, were I, and I've, I've read a bit about that, yeah. And to hear him talk about it, he's talking about all this stuff. And I think one of the things that's, you know, if you're a working painter who's trying to survive and make a living, this is a big struggle to get to the place where that voice, because not only does it happen in each individual painting, what we just talked about, where you struggle and struggle and you control and control, and then the moment comes when you let go. That's analogous to what happens in our, our entire career. Mm. You can look at painters, artists of any kind, and there are the ones who become stale because they keep repeating a formula, and they're the ones who probe and probe and push and push. And at some point late in their life, they find the voice where everything comes together. And that's their voice. And then they do it until they exhaust it. Yeah. You no. Know? Mm -hmm. And it happens through the trajectory of a whole career in the same way that it happens through the trajectory of a single painting. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I like that. I like that. So... Mm -hmm. Man, well, Christopher, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, man, I... Uh, I think we've packed passed, it in pretty well. Our time has passed by way too fast, actually. Okay. I really I really enjoy talking with you, man. Um, and, uh, Me too. Yes, yeah, it's great. It's great, great to connect with you. Um, this is a lot of fun. Um, and we need to do it again, actually. Absolutely. Well, we yeah. need to do it in person. You're, you're, you're going to have to be in this show this summer, and we'll we'll get together. Oh, that'd be... Yeah, I love it. Get it. It would mean you'd have to come to Santa Fe, of course, but you know. I'll come. I'll come. <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> oh, Thank you for having me. It's it's great to talk, and what a cool thing you're doing here. I love it. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so All much. Right. For All right. Take care. You too, man. Bye.